I am going over chapter summaries for matter and interactions from one chapter seven, internal energy. So before we get into that, let's just briefly uh, review the big, the big ideas we've done so far. And the very first one is this, the momentum principle. That's really where we started. Uh, this says that forces change the momentum of an object. And so we can write that as a time derivative of momentum. If the force is constant, we can write that as a finite change, but that's that. And then with that, we had a bunch of these uh, forces that you could calculate. So the gravitational force on the surface of the Earth, the real gravitational force, the force due to spring. Those are just some examples. There's more. And then the other thing. So really, we looked at this two ways. We said, what's the force? Calculate the force. Find the change in momentum. But there's some cases where we can find the change in momentum to calculate the force. So one of those was equilibrium. In equilibrium, I didn't write this down, but dp dt is zero. The change in momentum is zero, so, so an object stationary at rest would have a dp dt of zero. And then you can find something out about the forces. The other one was for circular motion. Uh, if we have an object moving in a circle at a constant speed, constant magnitude of momentum, but the direction changes, the magnitude of the derivative is this mv squared over r, and that's for circular motion. Then when we get over to uh, chapter six, we started a new way of doing uh, problems, and that was this work energy principle that says that the work is a change in energy. It's it's kind of like this, but this deals with vectors and, well, gives you a vector answer, and time, and this deals with uh, scalar answers, energy, and displacement. So we define the work done on an object as F dot delta R, so that's the dot product, um, and that's if the force is constant and the displacement is constant, you could move in a circular path and the displacement would not be constant. Uh, but if either one of those changes, then you have to do that as an integral. Uh, this could be complicated, uh, but we, we choose it for situations that are manageable, meaning like straight lines and stuff like that. So in term, that's the work. So in terms of energies, we have, <coughs> um, sorry, we have the, the, the particle energy uh, where gamma is one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. That was kind of a, it's kind of a big deal, right? Uh, because this tells us if a particle is moving really fast, its energy increases in, in cool ways. But even if it's at rest, if, if velocity is zero, it still has energy, that mc squared terms. And we use that for uh, nuclear reactions and stuff. Uh, we can approximate the energy of motion just as the kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And that's the only kind of energy you start off with is this particle energy and kinetic energy, depending on what system you choose. But if you choose a system with multiple interactions, you could do uh, a potential energy. So a potential energy is where you take a work done by internal forces and just change it into a potential energy, move it to the other side of the, 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 the graph up here. So uh, the two ones that we looked at were the change in gravitational potential energy near the surface of the Earth mg delta y and then this is the potential energy due to to this gravitational force and this is actually uh u at infinity equals zero so this is this is a change right potential energies we always want changes anyway okay so now let's go to chapter seven this is my little note make sure i put down what we're going to do uh, the first thing they do is to look at a spring. So remember, we have a spring like this. And I can write in the S direction, I can write the force, if it's, it's a one-dimensional spring, the force as negative KS, where S is a stretch, K is a spring constant. But remember that uh, since work, or the, um, I'm sorry, the change in potential is negative the integral of F dot dr, if I, I can actually write this and change it up to get fs is negative du ds. So the force in the x direction is negative, x actually a partial, but it doesn't really matter. The derivative of that potential with respect to s. So if I write that over here, I get that negative sign cancels du ds is ks. Now I can just multiply both sides by ds and integrate and get u is the integral of ks ds. And let's just integrate that without limits to get 1 half ks squared plus a constant. 
And we don't really care about the potential energy of the spring usually. Uh, what we care about is the change in potential. So if I have change in potential due to a spring, it's going to be uh, this and for the two different cases, and then that constant's going to go away because it's going to be in both terms. So the change in potential is one half k s squared, where uh, when s equals zero, u equals zero. So that's what we use. So that's the potential energy to due to the spring. It's super useful. We use it in a lot of different places. Now, if you go back to this ball and spring model, we we looked at that in chapter four. So here's. Uh, masses connected by springs make up matter, solid matter, like that, all over. That's not a bad picture. More springs. Okay. And it's possible that this thing could be moving. The whole thing could be moving. It could have, it could have kinetic energy. The whole thing could have potential energy, but if you move it up. But also, you can imagine just sitting there not moving at y equals zero, but all the masses are jiggling. So the center mass, the velocity of the center mass, the velocity of the block is zero, but it still has energy. Uh, it has internal energy. Now we don't want to uh, think about 10 to the 23rd particles in a block. It's just too many. So one way we deal with this is with uh, thermal energy. So it's thermal energy. This is the energy an object has associated with its temperature. I'll just put associated. And so what is temperature? Temperature. Uh, some people say, well, temperature is the kinetic energy of the particle. And that's, that's not completely true. It's not a bad idea either. Uh, really, temperature is kind of weird. The, the real answer is that temperature is the property that two have, objects have in common when they're in contact. If you take a a cold block and a warm block and put them in contact, they'll reach the same temperature eventually. And so that's actually how we define temperature. That's how a thermometer works. Um, but we can associate that temperature with an energy, and we call that thermal energy. So thermal energy, the change in thermal energy, delta E therm, I'll just write it as therm, is mc delta T. So this is the mass in grams. Usually we use grams. Uh, C is the specific heat. No, I'm sorry. It's the heat capacity. Wait. I get those confused. It's the specific heat capacity? I think I call it the, the specific heat. I might be wrong. I get that always mixed up. It's basically uh, a value of the energy joules per gram per Kelvin. We reuse Kelvin for temperature, and this is the temperature change. But the thing is, if you increase the temperature of an object, its thermal energy increases also. Um, this C constant tells the relationship between the amount, the change in thermal energy, and the actual energy. Um, this is why you know high values of C, like water, uh, are why you can be in fairly warm water but still get very cold because it takes a lot of energy to warm up that water so you lose a lot of energy uh, when when you're in there. Uh, or something like aluminum foil, even if it's really hot you can pick it up because it's very low mass so with a low mass uh, it has, doesn't have very much thermal energy and doesn't burn you. Okay, so that's, that's the thermal energy. When we're talking about thermal energy, especially in chemistry, uh, they'll, they'll talk about like this. Here's a block or a liquid or something like that, and it will increase in temperature. And it does that because you have to add energy to that system. And they usually call that energy Q, where Q is called the heat. It's not a really great word. We talk about add heat. Uh, Q is really, think of it as mini work. It's a type of work because you're adding energy to the system. But just so you know, when you see that Q, it is energy added to a system, just like work. And you could take it away, right? I could decrease the temperature of this object and you'd have a negative Q, just like you could decrease the energy and have a negative work. Okay, two more things. Power. Power we define as the rate of change of energy, delta E, delta T, or as a derivative, DE, DT. Uh, so it's, 
it, imagine this. I have a block right here. It's a one kilogram block, and I lift it up uh, one meter, and I put it up here. So that would take a change in energy of about 10 joules, right? One kilogram times one meter times 9.8, so it'd be 10 joules. Now, if if I use just, if I just do it very, very, very slowly, it's much easier than if I do this in a tenth of a second. And so that, even though they have the same change in energy, they'd have different powers because they take different times. So power is the rate of doing that work. And so if we have uh, power, is delta E over delta T, that's in units of joules per second, and that's equal to a watt. Which is, you see that all over the place, right? Uh, a three kilowatt generator, that's 3,000 watts. A 16, light, a 16 watt light bulb, that means it uses 16 joules of energy per second. Okay, so it's a, it's, we don't do a lot of problems with power, <clears throat> but it comes up and in a lot of calculations that are really related to real life because that's how we deal with things. Finally, we have this <clears throat> last idea of air resistance. If you have a ball moving through air, so air is a bunch of particles, and if this is moving, these are all going to deflect. Um, and when the, the, these particles of air change momentum, they require force, which means they exert a force on this. So we get the following for an air resistance force, negative one half rho A C, different C, V squared, V hat. So <clears throat> rho is the density of the air. And for normal air, it's 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. I mean, this actually works for other things other than air, but that's one you always see. Uh, A is the cross-sectional area. So a bigger object is going to have more air drag. And, and the, if you have a sphere, the cross-sectional area would be that of a circle. C is a drag coefficient, not the, co not the specific heat. We reuse these things. You know, you know that. You know we reuse all these variables. This is a uh, unitless parameter that depends on the shape. So you could have a, a cone and a sphere, and they could be the same size, the same cross-sectional area, but they have different drag coefficients. Uh, and then V is the velocity, and then V hat is a vector in the direction of the velocity so that the air resistance is in the opposite direction of the velocity. Okay, so that's that. I'll put a link down below to the rest of the chapter summaries if you need them.